one of the things that people have talked about with regards to AI ethics for a long time, I think as long as I've been doing AI ethics, so at least five years, is auditing, auditing algorithms. And that's always struck me as so weird. What does is, what is auditing look like? I mean, we're talking about ethically tough cases. We're talking about the ethical implications of a technology. How in the world can you possibly audit an algorithm when the algorithm exists in a broader system, in society at large, with all these variables, in ethically gray cases, what could auditing an AI possibly look like? And how could we possibly do it at scale? I could sort of see, you know, you send in some ethicists to sort of do an ethical audit, what's going on with this thing? Or you send in some technicians to say, okay, what are the technical specifications of the algorithm? But doing an algorithmic audit that's supposed to protect society at large, that, this was, that was just confusing to me. Luckily, Ryan Carrier is on the case. Ryan is the founder of For Humanity, a nonprofit that is meant to create and support the algorithmic auditing community. So I really tried to dive in here and say, you know, Ryan, what are we really talking about when we're talking about AI auditing? Is it really plausible? What are we supposed to do about ethically gray areas in the case of AI auditing? And I thought Ryan had really, really interesting answer. So he's on a mission. And so are the something like 1,000 plus people he has as part of the organization to support and to perform AI algorithmic audits so that people, organizations can be compliant with the regulations that are meant to protect us. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. I certainly learned a lot myself. All right, so I am, I mean, I used to use the word audit sort of I suspect in a way that you disapprove of. <laughs> I think you've educated me on how to properly use that term. And I know it's sort of a, a you know, you've got an ax to grind about using that term willy nilly. So, all right. So generally you're in the business of the nonprofit business of auditing AI systems. It's an independent audit. So maybe you can talk to me a little bit about what you mean by audit. What's an independent audit? Let go from there. So. What for the role for humanity plays in this ecosystem is to support everyone else who's doing audits or doing assessments. And, and that terminology where, where we think people use it sort of incorrectly is if you go to a company and you do a deep dive with that company, there's a lot of people who would call that an audit. It's not an audit. And the reason we protect the word audit is, is that when you build audit the right way, it actually establishes an infrastructure of trust. So I'll come back to that in a second. But the first part of it is, is we love people who go and do deep dives with entities to help them build more responsible AIs. But when you have a direct feedback loop to the company, you are by definition not doing an audit. It's an assessment, it's a consulting gig, call it what you will, but it is not an audit. Audit has three unique characteristics, and we know this from a 50 plus year track record of doing financial audits and the establishing this infrastructure of trust. Audits are done by certified and trained practitioners first. You know them as CPAs in finance, and we're in the process of helping to establish an ecosystem that will have hundreds of thousands of AI auditors over the coming years and decades. So number one, certified and trained practitioners. Number two, you have to have an independent third-party set of rules. We learned this all the way back in 1973 when there was this race to the bottom of financial audits where people were competing over effectively the rules to get business. And the industry said, no, this doesn't work. This is, this is not building good compliance, not building good understanding of financial accounting. So they basically said one set of rules, they created generally accepted accounting principles, and now it wasn't in the hands of those who were conducting the audits themselves. It was established industry-wide. And then interestingly, it was the SEC that mandated that all companies had to abide by these rules. So what we say in AI algorithmic and autonomous systems is we need an independent third-party set of rules. The third thing is the nature of the relationship between the auditor and the auditee. Unlike that first example where you're working together with the entity, feedback loop with the entity. Audit is a tension. And it's similar to that tension that we have with our teachers in school. You know, Reed, you didn't walk into any of your final exams. And the professor put, put his arm around you and he's like, Reed, 
buddy, don't worry about this test. When we get to the tough parts, I'll walk you through it. No, it's not the point, right? The point is, do you have the knowledge? We're testing. It's attention. Auditors are doing the same thing. Auditors are saying, look, society has said, here's a set of rules. We need to know if you've complied with them. And so when you do an audit, you don't do an audit with a company. You do an audit over a company. And that's because audits aren't done for the company at all. They're actually done for a third party. And that third party is the public. So as a proxy for society, as a proxy for the public, auditors are saying, we'll fill in for you. And we'll basically say, have you complied with the rules? But then we had to add one, one last quick point. We had to add the word independence. Independence says in that tension, I can't have any upside potential other than my audit fees. So I can't be providing you guidance, strategy, advice, remediation, software, platform, no other way to make money because then I might not objectively adjudicate, have you complied with the rules? And there's downside risk for that auditor because if that auditor says you've complied with a rule and you have not, they can be held liable for false assurance of compliance. When we set the tension up like that, then when I, as the auditor, tell the world you've complied with your rule, these rules, the world tends to believe it, and rightfully so, because now we've established this infrastructure of trust where the auditor is essentially with no incentive saying, yeah, they've done it. They've done everything they needed to, and they proved it to us, and we didn't have to give them that compliance. They proved to us that they earned it. And that is the great value to mitigating risk to humans, and that's why it's a key component of what For Humanity does. But to be clear, For Humanity does no audits. We don't do any pre-audit work. All we're trying to do is establish this ecosystem. Does that make sense, Reed? Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's, that's super helpful. So they got to be certified and trained in accordance with some third-party standards. And they have to be, they have to conduct the audit in such a way, or their business has to be such that they can receive remuneration based on the content of their audit. Right. Yeah. 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 That's okay. So you, you said this in another, in another, in another context. You conceive of yourself, sorry, not yourself, you're for human. When I say you, I mean for humanity and what you conceive of yourself as doing or what you are doing is you're not doing the auditing. You're, you're creating a community of auditors. Are you, are you is for humanity working on those third party standards? Is it receiving those third party standards from some other third party? You know, where, where are you in this mix? We go back to that list of three things we need certified and trained practitioners, and we need an independent third-party set of rules. So for humanity aims to make the rules. And when I say that out loud, it makes a lot of people in. They're like, for humanity, like, who are you? Why do you think you have this authority? Yeah. And I want to be very clear about this. We have no authority and we seek <laughs> no authority. But what we have is a, it, it, we have a, a missing element. We have laws guidelines, best practices, standards, none of these things are drafted and written to be auditable. Auditable means one thing, binariness. If I'm an at-risk, third-party, independent auditor, I need to be able to take in your evaluation materials, your proof materials, and go compliant or not compliant. There is no gray. Auditors can't do gray right? What they, if I have doubts about your compliance materials, and if you are able to comply, I have to say non-compliant because it's like, it's like a reasonable doubt in court. I have to basically say, I can't, I, we, you, you haven't proven the case, so I can't give you this mark. Okay. Yeah. So in establishing this, what we do in our crowdsourced and transparent way, all humans are welcome into for humanity to engage in this process take the law, guidelines, best practices, and standards, and craft them, it's an art, not a science, into auditable rules. But because we don't have authority, once we've done this work, we go back to governments, we go back to regulators, and we say, here, is this what you meant by GDPR? Is this mm -hmm. what you mean by the EUAI Act? They are the ones who can bless or endorse that set of auditable rules. 
when they do that, then for humanity gives them to everyone, every auditor in the world who wants to do this work, every teacher who wants to teach it, every pre-audit advisor who wants to advise on what compliance with these rules will look like, they're all eligible to use that and go make millions and millions and millions of dollars if they want. Fantastic. Because that's where change is occurring, right? That's where compliance is being built. All for humanity is doing is basically saying, here's the level playing field. You have to use it abiding by independence, abiding by anti-collusion. And then the second part of, of the role that we play, so we uphold these rules. We work with national accreditation bodies that will basically say, this group is sophisticated and skilled and trained and robust enough to issue certification. So we work with groups like that. And then the other thing that we do is we take individuals and we say, do you want to learn what compliance looks like based on these rules? And we train them to be the CPAs of this world. We call them for humanity certified auditors. They go through training programs to understand the details of what compliance means. That's the role we play to uphold and support the system for all. Yeah. So you're essentially the first thing you're doing is a kind of translation from laws and regulations to binary criteria. That's correct. That's, that seems to be the first thing. And then you train up these people who want to be auditors in understanding the regulations, the laws, how they were translated into auditable, that is to say, binary criteria, and then they can go out and do their thing. So, you know, lots of questions. I'm not even sure where to go. The one place I want to go is, okay, so who certifies the certifiers, right? So are, are you, is this for humanity sort of need the blessing of something like each and every government entity where the auditor wants to operate in that government entity's jurisdiction? So is this like a, you know, local, state, federal, different countries, you need to keep getting sort of approved by these various governments? Is that, is that how it works? And then I want to talk about the binariness of the of compliance and how that butts up against the, the grayness of tough ethical decisions, especially in high risk scenarios. So let's start with just with the sort of procedural thing um, before getting into the into the gray areas. How does it how does it work? How does for humanity get the blessing of government? A couple of different things that you would want uh, the certifications of, right? You want the audit criteria to be endorsed, blessed, approved, whatever term you want by sure. the enforcement body of government. So in other words, the one that writes the GDPR law and then is charged with enforcement, you essentially want to say, here's compliance with GDPR. Does this match with what you think the law says? So it's yeah. basically asking lawmakers to pre-approve compliance. Now, now, let's talk about that for a half second, because we have two ways to operate the law. You can operate the law from a strict enforcement point of view, in which case people do their stuff, do their stuff. They do something wrong, like a game of whack-a-mole. They pop their, their head up. They've done something wrong. And enforcement comes along and says, dang, right? You've broken the law. The problem I have with that is that people have already been harmed. If you broke the law, if you broke GDPR, if you broke privacy, people have already been harmed. And we, we from our mission, want to do better than that. So essentially, we think that this approach is a more proactive compliance with the law, where you can basically say, here's what compliance looks like. Why don't we prove it before people are hurt through independent audits? So we think it's actually a better application of the law. That's one. Next, we want to certify that the bodies doing audit are qualified. This is something that for humanity will only do in the absence of national accreditation bodies. And so to your point, if, if, if I were operating my own audit firm and I want to do that work in the UK, I have to get approved by UCAS. I have to get accredited by UCAS as a certification body. And then when I go to Germany, DAX has to approve me as well. Okay. So yes, you have to go based upon the local laws, local jurisdiction. This is a restricted activity. Not everyone mm -hmm. can be an auditor. They have standard. Okay. Sure. So that's the second part. The third part is the us training, training auditors at an individual level. And here I would say that when AI CPA was, was accrediting people as CPAs in the financial world for the first long time, no one said to them, oh, well, we better make sure that, 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 that you're teaching the right things because they were the experts. They were the ones leading the way and doing the work. 
that's kind of the seat that for humanity's in. However, all of our work is transparent. All of our process is crowdsourced. And so if someone were saying, well, I'm not sure if you're teaching the right things, I say, come on in, right? The courses are free. What we're teaching, how we go about it, we want more critique and criticism. Now, if any government said to us, we'd like to review and formally approve what it is you're teaching and how you're accrediting individuals, we'd say, fantastic. But right now, there's no one in that space. There's no one even qualified to adjudicate that. But maybe there will be in the future, and we're, we're all for it. Yes. Are you, are, is For Humanity the only game in town in terms of translating laws and regulations or pending laws and regulations to auditable criteria? I don't want to speak for other entities. There are some entities who try to write the rules, but even then, there's a lot of businesses who are out there saying, this is, this is our interpretation of the law and how you can be compliant with it. So there's a lot of people out there similar sure. to where Imagine we the were. Big, in... like big accounting firms are doing that, right? They, want to, they, they probably see dollar signs to audit AI. And so I imagine the big four are coming up the, with their audible criteria. Yeah, on the advisory side, the assurance side, the ones who have to issue the, the audits, they vomit at the IT. They're like, if you've mm -hmm. done it over here, we absolutely couldn't audit them, right? We can't audit sure, right. based on your own. And, and you know, I was- Because gonna, that would flout the advisory stuff. That, that would flout the independence. It, exa and it, it even it, it flouts the basic idea of what is being audited. I was in a workshop with the EU commission talking about the Digital Services Act, which is a law that is in force now, but the audit side of it doesn't get enforced until uh, 2024. And the big four were in there and the big four basically said, we can't do any of these audits until you get rules in place. Hmm. And they're not sitting there saying, we'll get you a set of rules. They're basically saying, you tell us what the rules are. I see, I see. So, that, so, so they still have plenty of money to make. They want, they want, I take it they're rooting for someone like you or an organization like For Humanity to get some established audit, audible criteria because then they can go to work auditing. That's, it, it, I believe so, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, you know, because I was wondering if there's other people, other groups trying to push their auditable criteria against yours, and there is this kind of, well, what constitutes, I mean, how did, maybe, I don't know how much you know the history of the, the financial audit, but how did that play out? I mean, how did, how was it decided that, okay, this, these are the auditable criteria, and are we seeing a similar kind of unfolding in the AI space? It'd be accident, actually. So what happened, I, as I mentioned before, in 73, one group would go out and do an audit and another one would come along and they'd say, if you audit my way, I can reduce your taxes. I yeah. can lower your cost of goods sold, things like that. And so you get this yeah. race to the bottom and the industry started very audit. quickly. And so the it's, industry just, it's a BS said, audit, right? Yeah. They said, we're going to establish one set of rules, generally accepted accounting principles. Now, we weren't a very global world in 1973. So about six months later in London, they established international financial reporting standards. In a lot of places, those things work. They fit together. In some yeah. places, they don't. So we have two sets of rules, and where they don't fit, we have conflict and problem, and it creates confusion. Now, neither one of those were mandated at the beginning. So it's a happy accident that we have what we call 10 Qs and 10 Ks, because the SEC essentially said, if you want to, you have to remember what was happening in 75, the, the world of trading equities for moms and pops, you know, real retail people for the first time getting in and buying stock, okay? That's what was happening in 75. And the SEC said, to protect them, we are going to mandate that you must follow GAAP. Or in the UK, they said you must follow IFRS. And like wildfire, within three or four years, every country in the world basically said, you're going to follow these two standards. So it was a happy accident that we mandated independent audit of financial accounts and reporting. It's a tougher road path to mandate that for AI algorithmic and autonomous systems, but that's a battle that we're fighting. The way we are moving forward is we're trying to uh, advocate for mandatory independent audits of all AI algorithmic and autonomous systems that impact humans that are either not prohibited, in other words, you can't do them anyway because somebody else yeah. said, or because they haven't passed a low risk assessment that says their impact to humans is small enough that they don't need to be audited. So in our world and scope, we will draft AI algorithmic and autonomous system audit rules for every system that impacts a human 
but they're risk-based. If it's a really pretty low risk to humans, the rules are going to be pretty simple. If it's super, super high risk, well, you're going to have to go through the, the entire detail of complying with an EUAI Act or other laws because there's a lot of risk to your tool. Right. So if your tool is recommending, you know, what color shirt to buy, low risk, no, no serious audit needed. If it's making, you know, to take the sort of almost by now cliched example, if it's making uh, predictions about mortgage repayment and distributing mortgages based on those predictions, that seems pretty high risk because it has, it has to do with access to people's uh, homes or security, things like that. So that's high risk. That gets a higher level of scrutiny. What's the, what's the probability that we're going to get independent audits required by regulations? So maybe you could say a little bit about what the regulations that are at play, some of the ones that are, obviously, there's the EU AI Act. You mentioned the Digital Services Act. I don't know, maybe tell us a little bit about some of those acts and how likely it is that you think we're going to get, by regulation, required independent audits. So let me start with two places where independent audit is already mandated. New York City, the city council, believe it or not, passed a law that said for automated employment decision tools, they must go through an independent bias audit, a very specific kind of audit. And so that law is almost in effect. It was actually slightly postponed from January 1st of 2023 to April 15th of 2023. So a slight postponement of enforcement. The other law is something called the Digital Services Act. This governs, it governs a lot of things. A lot of the rules covering just transmission networks and things like that are, are pretty minor. The major focus of the law is for what we call very large online platforms or very large search engines. And when I say search engine, you can immediately go Google right? Like you can, sure. this, this was a law written about Google. The primary role of this law is and this that is out of the EU, right? It is. This is a European Union. It is in, it just in the EU governing basically any platform that has 45 million users on average. And there's calculations for how that's, that's reached. Mm. But what they then have to do is they have to essentially establish an auditable process for how they deal with illegal content. Illegal content can mean terrorism. It can mean child sex abuse. It could be adult content. It could be, you know, there's a, a bunch of prescriptions already in law as to what constitutes illegal content. And essentially this law says, we want to know what you're doing with it, how you're handling it. And we want tracking and reports of how this is happening. It's, it's where illegal content meets censorship. It includes disinformation. And then misinformation seems to be the dividing line. How, how bad is misinformation when it becomes disinformation? Right. And by the way, eventually this is going to get settled by judges and, and, and courts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they governs illegal content primarily and how these entities are dealing with it, but it also governs even how we see what we see. So it deals with what we call recommendation engines or their law calls it recommender systems. And the easy way to, for people to think about what this is, is this is Netflix, right? When you put your Netflix on, it gives you a set of movies that it kind of says, oh, recommended for you or, you know, sure. because you watched, right? And so these recommendation engines, unfortunately, limit choice. And there's a question of, of is that limiting or restricting even fundamental rights? Right. So one of the things that this law is basically saying is, you must disclose your process for making recommendations. So mm -hmm. you have to explain why certain choices were made. So I watched Star Trek and now you're recommending yeah. to me Star Wars. Well, it's because, and you know, it'll say something like, well, it's, these are both science, classified as science fiction. It's our primary thing, but it might be other things too. The other thing that the DSA requires, Digital Services Act, is that you actually allow me to make changes. And, and actually my wife would, you know, probably cheer for this because, what she says is like, you've corrupted my Netflix with the last three things you watched. I want to see a rom-com. And she totally, can't yeah. find it because she yeah. can't reset the recommendation uh, parameters. So, mm -hmm. you know, she'll be excited about the fact that, that the law now requires that you can make those changes. This becomes more important in access to goods and services. And I'm using the Netflix example as kind of a, a fun and light example, but this can have real meaning in terms of what people can access. And so that's, that's the nature of why the DSA is there. 
Now, I mentioned both of these things because they require audits. And you asked the question about mm. where are we going and where are we headed? The EU AI Act, which is a wider impact to AI algorithmic and autonomous systems, that governs a lot more things. It doesn't go all the way to independent audit. It calls for a conformity assessment, some of which might be able to be informed from a self perspective. And as I mentioned before, this is suboptimal in terms of protecting humans, in terms sure, of sure. making sure that compliance exists in a verifiable way that is trustworthy. So even when we look at good new laws like that, we still want to take them one step further. And in the end, here's what I'd say, Reed. Financial audit has built an enormous 50-year track record of, of trustworthy process. It's not a perfect system. Not a perfect system. Not going to claim that at all. But it's sure. built such an enormous amount of trust that I think we will learn that the same applicabil applicability will make sense in the context of our AI system. Yeah, that's really interesting. A quick question about the Digital Services Act in particular. So they're supposed to monitor for illegal content. I have to imagine that butts up against some kinds of privacy concerns, right? That, oh, you're monitoring to see if what I've written is somehow suggestive of something illegal. So if I'm, you know, calling for, you know, storming the Capitol or something along those lines, I take it that a Google or a Facebook is supposed to notice that, right? And then sort of bubble that up some way, which requires them to engage in some kind of monitoring of all their content. And I take it then that, that the businesses are required by that, by the Digital Services Act to gather a bunch of data, right? That other people that say privacy advocates would be Hell bent against those companies collecting. Yep. And so it sounds like there is a conflict between the goals of the digital, or the content of the Digital Services Act, let's stop illegal activity from proliferating because of online activity. Let's do that. But that falls into tension with the things that privacy advocates, data privacy advocates are all for. And so is, is that a big is that a big to-do? Are there privacy advocates who are all worked up over the Digital Services Act? Yeah, and, and think about it here in the United States when we have these arguments about who should be allowed to be on Twitter and social media and so on, and when they've been taken off and when they go on. This is yeah. similar. So let, let's take something very specific. The, the novel Lolita, written by Nabokov, right, yeah. is about a relationship with a girl who is underage, and it talks about sex, sex acts with a girl who is underage. This would now be considered illegal content. Oh, whoa. It's, it, That's intense. Historically, also considered one of, the, one of the greatest literary works of all time, right? Right. Historically, no, right? Because it, it's already out there. So I don't know what they would do with, with historical pieces, okay? But let's say I go on and I make a, I don't know, a short video. Yeah, that is Lolita too. Yeah, Lolita, <laughs> right? That's going to get taken down as illegal content. Hmm. Um because it's going to show sexual acts with a minor, okay? Mm. And so this is the kind of, of censorship meets privacy meets we wrote laws that said what illegal content is. Now, let's take it to even more delicate places like self-harm, right? The, I, there, there are people who will make videos about self-harm and they will post them. Why are they doing it? Well, for a variety of reasons, okay? But what is actually being concluded is that the distrib distribution of that material is detrimental to the well-being of society, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. and therefore they want to restrict that distribution. So the Digital Services Act basically says, yes, this is, this is what self-harm looks like, and therefore we are not going to distribute it. It is mm -hmm. absolutely censorship, and it's, it's censorship from the context of we think this is good and wise for our society, what it, whatever that governs. It could be the EU, it could be the UK, it could be the United States, it could be a state, right? And everybody's going to have those different, what we call shared moral frameworks all around the world as to what's okay. Can I show sex acts with a 13-year-old? In some jurisdictions, the answer is yes, right? Be, just the same as I could get married. At, at different ages, right? Sure. So all of this is built in the context, at least from For Humanity's perspective, of what's the shared moral framework? We always uphold that local jurisdiction, shared moral framework. We also call it relevant legal frameworks. What are the pieces in place 
where you've defined what the law is, and then we will guide based on that law. So, so it's, there's, there's really tough ethical issues here, right? There's, there's, and there's room for, I take it, there's room for reasonable disagreement. Um, 100%, yes. Then I start to think, okay, so then wait, what is auditing doing? Is it really going to keep things within ethical guardrails or how, how, would, it, how would it do that? So let me, let me give an example that I think a lot of people or a lot of people in the, in the AI or digital ethics space are very familiar with, but maybe others are not. There's that famous Compass case, right? The ProPublica published this landmark piece in 2016. North Point developed this software called Compass that gave criminals criminal defendants risk ratings for the probability that they're going to commit crime within the next two years. They concluded upon their analysis that the thing is massively biased against biased. black people. The, the software predicted, even when holding fixed all other variables, like educational background, socioeconomic status, criminal history, much more likely to predict that a black person was going to commit a crime in the next two years and much more likely to commit a violent crime in the next two years. And so they said, look, this is a really biased system. And North Point said, look, there's lots of different ways of measuring bias. You chose a certain kind of metric for measuring bias. We've got this other set of metrics that we think are just as legitimate. Those are good metrics for bias. Now, it turns out to be, I take it, a really substantive, qualitative, ethical decision about what the appropriate metric is for bias. And there might also, there might, there may also be um, metrics that are legally or legally appropriate or inappropriate. But it's a qualitative decision to be made. It's not binary, or at least, you know, its binariness is belied by lots of gray stuff, like what's the appropriate one. So, you know, some independent auditor says, hey, did you check your AI for bias? Hey, did you share illegal content? And then it's going to be arguments about what there's going to be arguments about whether that was biased or not. There's going to be arguments about whether it was illegal. It's going to be right. So all the sort of those heavy, those heavy things are not something that a compliance officer or an, an independent auditor can engage in because they're not, you know, if you like moral oracles or something along those lines. So explain to me how third party you know, independent auditors protect us in high risk cases when there's moral conflict. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways I'm going to answer that. The first is that I'm going to, going to explain that in our ecosystem of independent audit of AI systems, we require a standing and empowered ethics committee who adjudicates all of these instances of ethical choice. And they do that in the context of a code of ethics that is transparently offered to essentially show this is the code of ethics which we are abiding by when they adjudicate these instances of ethical choice. Then we require public disclosure of that. So I want to start with this, and then I'm going to come back to, to more of what audit actually is going to uncover. But let's take the famous trolley problem, right? I have an autonomous vehicle. It has to hit grandma or the babies. I have no other choices. I have to do one. So I'm Tesla, and you know, based on our shared moral framework, we code that we're going to hit grandma. So now we tell the world that our car, if faced with this choice, will hit grandma. Mm. Point number one, we have to publicly disclose these things. Why? Because I would argue with you, or and you, we might agree on this, but I, I would basically say that <laughs> even if I make that choice, let's say you and your hundred friends all say, damn it, that's the wrong choice. Okay. You have a right to say that's the wrong choice. We would all agree with that but you actually don't have a right to tell me that my choice is wrong because this is my shared moral framework and that there's only one entity that could change that and say, Tesla made the wrong choice. That entity is society. If, and, and we can't have that societal discussion about this ethical choice without the transparency. So you have to have the transparency to create what I call a virtuous feedback loop that allows us to then begin to decide and make decisions at a societal level, if there are certain ethical choices, we only want to make in one direction. So that's part number one. Part so sorry. Let, let, go ahead. Before you get there, let, let me see if I understand this. So number one, part of the independent audit is verifying that they have an ethics committee. Yes. 
and that that ethics committee's deliberations are guided by, it sounds to me like two things. Number one, some statement of principles or values or guidelines or so something along those lines. So, you know, we're for fairness, we're for transparency, we're for respecting people's privacy, blah, 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 that sort of thing. And right away, I want to say, well, that's, you know, some of those statements are, most of them are so wishy-washy that they, it'd be almost impossible to run afoul. Like, we're for good judgment. Well, yeah, everyone's for good judgment <laughs> in principle. The Nazis are for good judgment. They just have, you know, their output of what they take to be good judgment is, is morally abhorrent. But then you add this interesting layer, I think. This is, so it's that not only that the ethics committee is guided by some high-level statement of standards, values, principles, whatever, but also that they have to create, this is what I call anyway, ethical case law. So they have to create scenarios that that company has faced is likely to face, et cetera. I don't know how many such scenarios they have to concoct, but they have X amount of scenarios and they have to say in that scenario, we will do this. And then they have to be public about that. And then I take it what the auditor is going to do is going to say, do you have an ethics committee? Yes, no, good. Do you have an ethics statement or whatever you want to call it, a value statement? Yes, no. Do you have these scenarios where you've issued your decisions about what you would do in those situations? Yes, no. And then in this particular instance that I'm auditing you, did you act in a way that is commensurate with the, all that stuff? Yeah, the process the, the, that you've laid out. That's correct. Right. Are you commensurate with the decisions, the ethical decisions that you made for those very scenarios? Yes, no. And, and uh, the only thing I would add, you did that exactly correctly, and that it's publicly displayed. We're going to, that's right, easily right. measured and tested. Is it public or not? Okay. So but let me, let me push a little bit though. So. One of the things that a lot of ethical deliberation consists in for ethically tough cases is, is argument by analogy. So, so it's sort of like, the, you know, such and such is okay. I'll just give you a, you know, let, let's say, you know, people think that there's a right to refuse treatment, medically speaking, right? So doctors can't force feed you medicine. If you say, no, leave me alone. I don't want to be treated. It's an ethical and also now a legal right, at least in the U.S., that you have a right to refuse treatment. And, you know, you can and die as a result. Some people argue from that to thinking, well, look, a case of euthanasia is not so far off from that. It's about bodily self-determination. And so really, a case of euthanasia is acting in a way that's commensurate with our respecting people's rights to bodily autonomy. Ugh, but that's that's tough, right? Is it really acting in a way that's commensurate? Are there other ethical factors at play? Lots of people who oppose, who oppose euthanasia would say, yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's, more, there's more going on here. It, actually, you might still think that euthanasia is ethically permissible, permissible, but think that there are other complicating factors. And so euthanasia is not, you know, you can't give a yes, no. Is it commensurate with a case of refusing treatment? It's, a, it's tough. So how does an auditor say, OK, look, you have these 12 or whatever scenarios that your ethics committee created. Those look, you know, legit scenarios. It's not like if a dragon came down, what would we do? They're, they look actually they they're they, they are cases that are likely to be actual business cases, actual cases that come to their front door. And you have you've made certain judgments about them, but then they've got to make this really tough case since the, the 12 are almost by definition generic. They don't cover all the nuances of the of the world. In this new case, is this new novel case commensurate with, and how you acted in it, commensurate with your existing ethical case law? That's a really, that itself can be a substantive ethical decision to make, no? What's that? And, and essentially what the auditor's role in that equation is, did you engage in your process to reach the conclusion that you made? And let's, let's say mm. that, that the conclusion you made is not consistent with your existing shared moral framework as represented by your code of ethics and, and principles of code of data ethics, okay? So, and we have a live example of this. Axon Technologies had surveillance drones in place, right? Yeah. After Uvalde, they had surveillance drones in place that were scanning for threat actors around schools. So the CEO of Axon basically said, maybe we should put tasers on our drones. So you've gone from a surveillance company to now yeah. you are a defensive weaponry company, okay? Mm -hmm. And so from a shared moral framework perspective, this is when the ethics committee, now the ethics committee for Axon kind of spit the dummy and they said, we're out. 
Yeah, they walked out, right? Half of it, half of it resigned. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't support that at all. Okay. Mm. You as a standing and empowered ethics officer in these committees have to act in the best interest of the company that you work for. And part of what being a good ethics officer is, is let's talk about what you just said. You just changed our shared moral framework. Let's talk about if we want to do that. If my opinion is we shouldn't be a defensive weaponry committee, you know, company, well, eventually I can resign. If I don't want to be part of your, this shared moral framework, Eventually, I can sure. resign. But for now, we need to have a more robust discussion about are we changing our shared moral framework and what is the impact on our employees, on our stakeholders, on people who are buying this? What choices do we make? Do we make drone sales with or without tasers? Let other people choose. Like, how do we do this? So to me, this is what the auditor is checking is do you have this process in place? Not I see. what so decision did you reach? Yeah. So when they when they when they make that judgment, do you act in a way that's commensurate with your existing standards that you publicly communicated? They're not trying to figure out whether you got to the right answer. They're trying to figure out whether you put forth the effort to get to the right answer. So it's going to be something like, let's see your meeting minutes. Was there meeting minutes that details the debate that was had about this novel case? And as the independent auditor, you may think if you like personally, yeah, I think that, you know, Sarah had a really great point. They ignored her in the meeting. She was absolutely right. But that's not for me. That's not what I'm auditing. Did did Sarah speak up? Did they have the meeting where they discussed it? Yes. And then I guess the idea is something like, look, what more do you want from us? Right? <laughs> like we, we, we are checking to see that the companies are leg- are actually doing their ethical due diligence or something along those lines. We can't. It's not a moral. It's not a moral standard that we're holding them to. It's something like a procedural standard, but that procedural standard requires them to have something like genuine ethical risk analyses, deliberations, assessments, et cetera, throughout the AI lifecycle, and that's what you're checking for. Right. And, and and when we think along those lines, then we can get to places that don't deal with gray. We basically say you will solve your gray in your way. But when you prove it, you're going to prove that you did or didn't do what was required to reach the conclusions that you made. So so I take it, you know, it's clear, I think, from that, that you're going to have, let's say, just say views on the left, views on the right Hmm. within a company. There's going to be Patagonian. There's going to be Hobby Lobby. And it's sort of within the realm, let's suppose it's in the it's in the realm of reasonableness. So they're definitely going to get passed. What about ethically? Well, you might that are organizations that hold the views that maybe they're not illegal, maybe it flirts with the illegality, but it seems to be outside at the at the bounds of you know ethical uprightness. You know, an organization that aggressively, I don't know, I, I'm not, I can't think of a, an example off the top of my head at the moment, but yeah, I don't know. I know where you're going, so so let's go to a place that that most people really struggle: offensive weaponry. National Security, Department of Defense. I would be the first one to argue that there is no one who needs an ethics committee more than that because the ethics are life and death, full stop, right? In every decision that's made. Now, if you were to publicly espouse all the choices that you made, you're actually hurting national security. People would know how to defeat your offensive weaponry. So we can't have that. But it doesn't mean that you don't have an ethics committee that's operating under the existing principles of either law or the shared moral framework of DOD in the context of national security that's still being overseen by what I would call like a FISA-esque review. Have you engaged in the process? Have you done the right kind of things in security? For Humanity would go into that room and help them build that ethics committee, but we would not do it with, oh, you can just do what you want, we basically say we want real legislative oversight so that when these things are happening, they're being checked that you stuck to your process. Right. But so, you know, I don't know. Imagine something like an organization that supports in some way people, who, you know, they flirt with illegality. They in some way or other support people who want to commit, let's say, illegal acts. But what that organization is doing is not, as of yet, illegal. 
I don't know. They're, they're supporting what? I uh, the one community point. of people who want to storm the Capitol or yeah, something I, along those lines. Are, can they pass an audit? I, I have one for you. Let's use okay. Saudi Arabia. Okay. okay. For Humanities Shared Moral Framework celebrates gender equality. Okay. Mm. That's our moral framework. However, okay. we still allow independent audit of AI systems to be used in Saudi Arabia. Why? Because we're jurisdictionally sensitive first. So what we would allow is that a Saudi company could build its own shared moral framework, its own code of ethics and data ethics that does not celebrate and, and uphold gender equality. Hmm. So you absolutely in Saudi could pass a, a, an audit yeah. of compliance yeah. because, look, we, I used to say, and I was totally wrong when I said it, that we don't force ethics on anybody. We do. There are a certain set of ethics based in what independent audit of AI said, independence, transparency, disclosure, we do force those requirements and that will rule sure. some countries out of working in our stuff, okay? But we try to keep it as limited as possible to say, he, you operate under your shared moral framework, as long as it's consistent with the law, whatever your laws are, that's an important part of what that shared moral framework is. But remember, we also then demand transparency. And that's the only way we feel like we can allow and get into some tough areas, tough questions, but we say, you got to tell people. So sure. well, in the case of the Saudi companies, you have to say, you know, well, they're not going to say it, but it's not going to be there, right? They're not right. going to celebrate gender equality. Okay. Sure. And so now people at least have more information. They can be like, I'm not working with that company because I care about gender equality. At least right. that information yeah. is available. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That's really interesting. Brian, thank you so much. This was totally fascinating. I mean, I feel like I could talk to you for a lot more time and we didn't even get into details of more regulations, regulations that are coming around, coming out in the US and the probability of those regulations passing is going to be. But yep. when, when, when some more stuff happens, I want you to come back and, and talk to me. I was going to say, let's just do it again because it's good fun and, and I love hanging with you. So Sounds great. Me too, man. All right. I'll talk to you later. Thanks All so right. much. Cheers. Thanks, Reed. Bye.